I felt like all the young ladies that I spent all this money on, I bought purses, I bought this on, they left me hanging. Um, all the brothers that I was trying to impress, to be cool with, to be a part of an organization, or even just to be friends with, they, they left me hanging. And I thought that my parents had abandoned me because it was like, hey, my father says, since you think you're a grown man, go be that grown man. Mm. And to this day, I'm grateful for that season. I just wish I could have went back and operated differently in that season. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Brandi Harvey. I'm so excited that you have decided to join us for today's conversation. You are at Vault Empowers Talks, and we do not just scratch the surface. We delve deep into the lives of the world's most influential people, entrepreneurs, thought thinkers, and teachers. All right, and today is like no other. I have Anthony O'Neill here, number one, best-selling author, course creator, speaker, educator, host of The Table with AO, and founder of The Neatness Network. The man got a network, y'all. He is real, he is relevant, and he is relatable for such a time as this. Vault Empowers Talks. Welcome, Mr. Anthony O'Neill. I mean, can we just run that intro back one more time? <laughs> I mean, I've never had an intro like that before. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Uh, I know, but Brandy, That's thanks for having thing. me on. Man. I am so excited. Man. You know, I can go ahead and put that down because I just know that I'm not going to need these notes. We didn't have a whole interview and interview I mean, plus. We've been talking for about an hour. <laughs> We did. We just been letting it flow. Yeah, so this is a good. good thing. It's been good. I, so I I'm excited. I am too. Yeah. Now the questions I'm a little nervous about. You are not nervous. <laughs> but you <laughs> said you have never been asked some of these questions. Never in my life. Yeah. Never. And you know, I know a lot of people do not give their questions beforehand because they want you to kind of be on the fly. But because we go deeper, Absolutely. you know, I want you to have a framework yeah. of how we are gonna gonna navigate this journey we're about to go on. It's a journey. <laughs> And the ending is dope. That's all I'm going to say. So Listen, stay to the end. We, stay to the end. Do you hear that? The man is giving you a directive. Go ahead and hit the subscribe oh, button man. right now. Okay? You already got a directive. Okay? Yeah. So it. I'm excited. You grew up, mm -hmm. you know, Kojic kid. You were a church kid. Yeah. Church all day, every day. Mm. You were talking about, you know, these kind of foundational principles that kind of shaped your life with church. Yes. Like, what was it like? Man, you know, for me growing up, I grew up in a very strong Christian faith home, right? Yeah. So one side is heavy Kojic. The other side is missionary Baptist. Oh, Chad, right. you was just... All over. I got a headache from it. You was baptized. <laughs> All day, you know. And so my mom and other father and siblings live in San Diego, California. And we grew up missionary Baptist, mm -hmm. right? And then my biological father and other mother live in the Carolinas. And we, they grew up, uh, we grew up on that side, Kojic and Pentecostal. Oh, wow. And so there was no football games. You know, there was no dating there was no going out and having a good time. It was go to school. I mean, even down to the point, Brandy, I, I have on Chelsea's now, but I had to wear what they call church schools back in the 80s to school. Okay. So I, I couldn't wear tennis shoes. It okay. was, it was no, you got to look like a man of God <laughs> everywhere you go. And the man of God had on church shoes. Church shoes. <laughs> With sometimes looking like Carlton from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air with the shirt on and the sweater wrapped around my neck. Oh, that was how you dressed? Oh, absolutely. Okay. It was, you got to be presentable at all times and represent the kingdom at all times. Now, I have some tennis shoes, and some days they'll let it slide, but for the most part, you know, they were very, very strategic on how I looked and how I represented not just God, but even our church at the yeah. same time. And so I grew up in a very strong, never, never kissed a young lady then. Um, I remember trying to give a young lady a gift, and her father gave it back to my dad. You were in high school? I was in high school. Oh, wow. Um, and there there really was no youthfulness. I was an armor bearer in church. I don't know if people know oh, what an wow. armor bearer is. Yeah, tell the audience. <clears throat> so the armor bearer is, think of a, a guy who just carries the Bible, carries the water, and prays for the pastor before he preaches. Yeah. So the thing is, that today what we call a security or <laughs> their... Uh, executive assistant. Executive assistant, <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, I, w I, I was that guy at 15 mm. years old, carrying the water, carrying the Bible, praying over the pastor. If he need anything, make sure he got to his car, da da da, da. I did all that stuff. So the, my entire youth life was around older people. It never was around the younger people. Mm. I only went to school with them. Outside of that, 
I was around 40, 50, 60 year olds my entire life. Wow. So you really, you do have a very old soul. And I think I that, that plays into like you being groomed for leadership yes. and now even what you do as an entrepreneur. Absolutely. I do. I wish I didn't have it at that young of an age though. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because I knew how to have church. Mm. I didn't know how to live life. I didn't know how to, how to approach a woman. I didn't know uh, what, for an example, what credit was, what, what interest was. Um, I never had the conversation about sex, you know. And so when I graduated high school, it was let me leave this all behind because God is boring to me. God is whack to me. Let me go just be young in youthfulness. I'm out on my own. I'm about to go enjoy this world. And literally, I remember the very first day of college, I, I, I remember getting out of the car, stepping onto uh, the college campus, and I said, I'm about to wild out. <laughs> you, you made I literally said that. I'm about to have a blast. Where did you go to school? And so uh, at first, I went to Palomar College. Okay. And when I went, when I went there, I was like, okay, uh, let me see. And Palomar College is a community college. And I, I promise you, it was, I never finished school uh, because let's just say I made a lot of bad decisions. <laughs> Uh, God was not uh, a part of my life at that time. I still believed in him, but I didn't really, I didn't want to rock with him, put it like that. You didn't want to rock with God. Mm -mm. You were 19, mm -hmm. $35,000 in debt. Mm -hmm. You were living in your car mm -hmm. in the Walmart parking, parking lot, lot yeah. two miles from your parents' house. Yeah, absolutely. Not even, is it two miles from there? Yeah. Yeah, it's right, right off of Highway 76 in Oceanside, California. So, yeah, about a mile, two miles. Brandon, that's good. You did your research. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, and that came from because while I was in school, um, I was like, you know what? I'm a wild out. I'm enjoyed. And so, you know, everyone is joining these fraternities and sororities. And, uh, you know, I only think there's only one great one out there. Um, I never crossed, but if I would have crossed, um, it would have been Kappa Alpha Psi. Really? Absolutely. I, you know what? I wouldn't have gotten Kappa vibes from you. What, you would have thought Omega? N no. Oh, I would have okay. thought you Dang, why Alpha. you got to say no like that, though? Because Your Omega's, facial expressions. Omegas have a totally different, <laughs> like, it just be awesome. Like, you hey, know, listen. It's, it's a different type of vibe. I would have thought that you would have pledged Alpha. You a lot me, of people thought that. You give me Alpha a, vibes. a lot of people thought yeah, Alpha or Kappa, but I grew up yeah. in high school. My dad did let me join the step team. And I only could step at competitions that wasn't on Friday or Sundays. So you stepped for church? No. Who you stepped for? My high school. Okay. Oh, I, thought, <laughs> I thought you were stepping for Jesus. Great. Dang. I like this. This is going to be a good one. I thought you were stepping for This is going to be a good one. <laughs> hey, listen, man. I'll step for him now. <laughs> you know? No, no, no. I was on the step team for our high school. Okay. Uh, my dad allowed me to do that as long as, again, it didn't contradict, not contradict, but conflict with us going mm. to church. So if our competitions was on Saturday, I could do that all day long. But I couldn't do it if it was on a Friday or on a Sunday or if we had to travel. And so growing up, I always, I was a Kappa mascot. I was, I was a Kappa young blood and uh, just really sipping for the brothers. Oh, wow. And so when I went to school, I got online and I did some, some things that I wasn't so proud of. And unfortunately, I had to drop out of school for making some bad decisions. Wow. Yeah. So you dropped out of 19. Yep, yep. And so with those bad decisions, you said that, you know, you began to have some suicidal thoughts when you were in that, in that yeah. Walmart parking lot. Yeah. And, and you know, when I <clears throat> think about that, I, I have empathy for the people who are on the streets now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if I, if I, if I, if I keep it real, yeah, there were two times in my life to where I had to write on a brown board. Can I have some money for food? Wow. Growing up. I always judged those individuals. Wow. Growing up, I always thought they were just asking for money for, for drugs, for wow. whatever. No, I was sincerely hungry. Wow. And Anthony O'Neill, people do not know this. No. I mean, what a journey that means you've had. Hard journey. Yeah. And the suicidal thoughts came from people looking at me and judging me. Mm. When they didn't even know, I just made some bad mistakes. I'm honestly, I'm at the, I'm, I'm standing at the light. There was a gas station. I remember the gas station. Mama, daddy, put in the comments if y'all watching. It was a gas station off of Highway 76, right in front of the Walmart. You turn right. This is right. in San Diego. This is in San Diego, California. Mm -hmm. And I remember being there and I'm looking for my parents' car to make sure if I see them, I run opposite. Oh my God. Because my mom and dad, I lied to them and told them that I'm actually <sighs> staying with my girlfriend at the time. Well, my girlfriend and I actually have broken up because... I never said this publicly, 
um, I did something so young and dumb to where I was actually dating her when she was involved with another man who was overseas. He came back home and they shared a place. So I couldn't go there. Anthony. So mom and daddy's thinking I'm with her. She's thinking I'm back at home and I'm on the streets. Oh my goodness. I, I lied, right? I lied. And so now I'm looking for people, cars that I know that's in my family so that if I see them, I can run the opposite way. Mm. But I remember people looking at me rolling up the window. I'm a black man with a yeah, cardboard on, yeah. the, on the side of the street. And I don't look, I don't look crazy. I, I mean, I had on some decent clothes and I just remember um, everyone driving past me and no one giving me any money. Mm. No one. I remember going to the Oceanside uh, Boys and Girls Club in the YMCA during the week and having to take showers. Wow. You know, I remember those times and I remember sleeping in the back of the car and I'm like, why am I here? My mom and dad is sleeping in some real nice stuff. They got a house. They're not rich. They're not wealthy, but they got a roof over their head, eating good food. And I'm sitting in the back seat of the car. And that was when I started blaming everyone else but me. Mm. And that's what led me to depression because I didn't feel loved. Mm. I felt like all the young ladies that I spent all this money on, I bought purses, I bought this on, they left me hanging. Um, all the brothers that I was trying to impress, uh, to be cool with, to be a part of an organization, or even just to be friends with, they, they left me hanging. Mm. And I thought that my parents had abandoned me because it was like, hey, my father says, since you think you're a grown man, go be that grown man. Mm. And I remember leaving the my bedroom window because I couldn't make it to the front door. It was that bad of an argument between me and my father there in California. And I remember leaving that time, but my father simply said, hey, go be a grown man. And to this day, I'm grateful for that season. I just wish I could have went back and operated differently in that season. Oh, of course. You know, because it's, it, yeah. it made me who I am today. Yeah. Did you carry a level of shame? Shame from? Being in the parking lot, holding the sign. Was there a level of shame that you had? I would say shame, embarrassment, mm -hmm. less than, um, because that's not my parents' journey. I didn't see them struggle to that extent. Um, and for me, I was embarrassed because I internally I knew I was the problem, mm. but externally I didn't want to own it. So what was the shift in the mindset that said, it's me and I got to fix where I am? I tell you, I was uh, at the mall um, and met a young lady and lied to her. Jesus. Um, and you know what? It's a lot of them getting lied to out here like this now. <laughs> lied to her. You made to help somebody. <laughs> made, her, made her think I had all my, my, my uh, pretty much I had my life in order. Hmm. Um, and so she invited me over to watch Bad Boys. And I was like, all right, bet. This was on a Saturday. Well, Boys and Girls Club and YMCA is closed. Hmm. Can't go home. So I, got, I, got a, I can't go over there funky. So I literally went to the side of Walmart, filled up the bucket of water, filled up the bucket with water, and put Dawn dish detergent inside of it. Because, you know, back then when we washed our cars, we used Dawn. We didn't really use, you know, the car wash stuff. We just put Dawn in there. And uh, I took that to the back of my car, and that's how I started washing myself to go over to the young lady's house. So I'm sitting in the back seat of the car, and I have soap suds from my neck all the way down. And that's when the Holy Spirit really got a hold of me and I, I, you ever seen yourself in the mirror, but then you saw something much more than what you actually see? Yeah, yeah. And that was me. I'm mm -hmm. like, I am 19 years old. I have Dawn dis detergent on my body right wow. now to go impress a woman when I don't even have my life in order. Mm. And I literally broke down crying in the back seat of that car wow. because I'm lying to everyone around me. I'm blaming everyone around me and I'm not owning for my decisions. And so I didn't make it uh, to that lady's house, because I remember staying in the backseat of that car and I, and I cried all night. Um, and I went home and apologized to my father um, in California and my mom and said, hey, listen, I made some bad mistakes. I own it, I'm sorry. And I'm just ready to uh, really become, become a man. Mm. Because I realized if I'm gonna change my future, then I gotta change who I am today. Absolutely. And, you know, one of my good friends, your good friend, too, Darius Daniels, he said something a while ago that I've, I've lived by. And I always say it now, I add my own little flair to it, that the caliber of my future, the caliber of my financial future will be determined by the financial choices that I make today. And I remember saying, you know what, I, I want to be wealthy. Yeah. I, I don't want to be rich like what I see on BET and MTV at that time. 
I want a level of freedom that I don't see a lot of black people having. And so I went home, owned it, lived with my parents for six months, left and never looked back. Wow. You had to have your prodigal son moment. I did. Yeah. I did. I did. And you know what's funny is I had my prodigal son moment, but I didn't go all the way back. You know, like I went back, but I was still making some errors and some issues um, while I was learning and growing and evolving. I was 19 years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it was like, okay, um, let's do it. I mean, I went back and got three jobs. Wow. Three jobs. Bill collector, washing cars, delivering newspapers. I didn't have, I didn't have time for friends um, because all of my friends were fake. You know, all of them were living a life, looking like we had something, but when really... In the back, in the back of it all, we're asking each other for five dollars to go to McDonald's get something to eat. Mm -hmm. But we're driving Range Rovers, Mercedes Benz, wow. BMWs, and I was like, I don't want that life anymore. Mm. So I had to change. You had to change. Had to. So you then start, <clears throat> excuse me, getting your life together. Mm -hmm. You start making these different changes. What then led you into the financial space, the world of Dave Ramsey, yeah. and that kind of shift yeah. in your evolution? You know, I was studying and I was like, okay, what what is wealth? Like what is what is wealth? What is richness? What what is that? Uh, I was driving in LA one day and I saw a Bentley. And I was like, man, that's nice. And I remember going by the Bentley store to look at it. And yeah, of course, you know, you you 19, 20 years yeah, old. Yeah. They ain't paying you no mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to see what 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 it felt like. And so I said, you know what, I want to know how can I get this. So I started just studying people. For years and for years, had my jobs. I was working. Um, I started learning about Dave Ramsey and his approach to money. I was reading Robert Kiyosaki on his approach to money. I was reading um, other people on their approach to money. And I was like, okay, I, I'm reading all these. And I'm like, hmm, use other people's money <laughs> or have yours and own it all. Mm. And so I started playing with both a little bit. And as I was growing and evolving, I started realizing, man, I actually like owning what I have. Yeah. I actually like saying, you know what? This is my car. Uh, this is my my jewelry. I, I'm not financing nothing. Yeah. This is my jacket. I didn't I don't I have to pay no interest on it. But then when I was using other people's money, I felt the stress of, dang, I gotta pay this thing back that I bought like <laughs> six months ago. Uh, and, right. and I was getting stressed. Yeah. And I'm not knocking people who do that. But for Anthony O'Neill, I was like, wow, I really like this. So I took Financial Peace University. And I was a youth pastor at the time from one of my good friends and my spiritual father, Bishop Rudolph McKissick Jr. out of Jacksonville, Florida. He saw the amazing work I was doing in Fayetteville, North Carolina with youth and young people there. He was like, hey, come over here. Be a full-time youth pastor for us. And he allowed me Wednesdays. We didn't really preach. Wednesdays, we taught. Mm -hmm. practical life money skills to yeah. young people. So we taught them how to date. We taught them how to go out on a date on a budget. Uh, we, we taught them how to open the door. <laughs> we, we taught them about credit. We taught them about uh, student loans. We taught them how to get into college without debt. Sundays, it was a full service spiritual. But one thing, reason why our ministry just blew up so well there is because I started teaching the trueness of how to really build wealth. Yeah. And then that's when doors started opening up from preaching for Mega Fest, doing stuff for Eddie Long when he was alive, doing stuff for Creflo Dollar, doing stuff for a lot of big names in the ministry. And then long and behold, man, Dave Ramsey was looking for a youth personality on his team. And his team reached out and said, hey, man, we love what you're doing in the areas of money and spiritualness. Why don't you come and work with us? And it was it was amazing. But I'll be honest, I wasn't looking for Dave. Yeah. You know, I really wasn't. I thought that I was going to be a speaker or a preacher or a pastor for the rest of my life. So what's so interesting is, is this is the 19 year old mm -hmm. who's in the parking lot mm -hmm. of Walmart mm -hmm. running, hiding with his cardboard sign. So his parents don't see him. Yeah. Makes this apology to come back home. Yeah. I want to be a man. I get it right. Who then who's running away from God yep. and goes all the way back to God and says, I'm about to be a pastor. I'm about to be run a youth ministry and be a youth personality in you know, in the Christian field and world. But see, I don't really think, have I ever said this before? Wow, oh, Brandon, you better get this. I've never said this before. People, this is, the, it, it, <laughs> it, we need to call I've this never podcast, told people, I've never said this before. I've never said this before. It's like, I'm thinking about it. I, I didn't go looking for, to be a pastor. The ones who are called really are never looking for I never, because here's why. Can I be real? Yeah. 
your boy wasn't a virgin, so I knew I couldn't be a pastor <laughs> and <laughs> having sex. So I wasn't looking for it. It's a lot of life I'm going to be real. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I can't live my life and serve God on the pulpit. I wasn't looking for it. I was like, you know what? So what a lot of people don't know is I started a nonprofit called Young People Succeeding. And so I was selling cars. And while I was selling cars, I started this nonprofit. Well, the pastor who raised me, he had a big conference and he said, hey, I want a youth side of this conference. Mm -hmm. Since you're already going into high schools and teaching young people how to succeed that right, the right way, the healthy way. How about you come do this? Mm -hmm. I was like, eh, OK, I'm, I'm not a pastor. Yeah. I can I can put this thing together. So I'm bringing in people like Canton Jones, Kiara Sheard, uh, Coco brother when he was, you know, back in them days. I mean, I, Ty Tribbett. I mean, you name it. We was bringing in the big names of Fayetteville, North Carolina. Then all of a sudden, it's like, yo, bro, can you come speak at this youth conference? Yo, bro, can you come do this? Hey, man, can you come do that? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm answering the call. And watch this. I'm answering the call. And I started learning and started seeing that my life started slowing down in the other areas. Mm. I didn't say stop. I, I, you speaking my language. I, I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm serious. I'm, right? I'm, I'm like, it. okay, yeah. God is rising me over here. Yeah. And this is slowing down over here. And next thing I know, I didn't go seeking for it. Um, a pastor in Fayetteville, North Carolina said, hey, how about you come be my youth director? And that was for Amy Zion Church. And I was like, a youth director? You've been on the Monopoly board of denominations. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I know it all. And, and I'm like, what is a youth director? He was like, well, you come work for me full time. And it's your job to just focus on the youth and teach them what you're doing. Mm. And I was like, okay. And I didn't know when I signed up for that with AME Zion, you gotta go through four years oh, wow. of education to be ordained a minister. So this thing I know, if I'm gonna accept this job, I gotta be a minister. And I'm like, I'm now a pastor. <laughs> and I felt like I couldn't run from it because I really enjoyed helping young people grow. Yeah. yeah. But then I was scared because I'm like, wait, if I accept this, I can't enjoy this. I got to shift some stuff. I do. Yeah. And have I made the right decisions since I've been in ministry? No, I haven't. I've, I've definitely uh, fallen short. But it was like I wouldn't go back and not accept a ministry assignment over my life. Yeah. Because that ministry assignment for my life, it helped me probably more than it helped others. Because I was able to accept my calling and accept the anointing God has over my life. And I feel as if if I would have ran from it, I probably would have ended, ended up back on the streets. Mm. Because while selling cars, I was making all this money. And I'm sitting there trying to get out of debt, but I'm selling cars and I'm in a strip club. Mm. By selling cars, I'm, I'm, I'm making all this money and I am, I'm trying to impress the ladies. And I think God knew there's an assignment over your life. Yeah. I need to pull you out of it while you have enough room to hear me. Mm. And I'm so grateful for Bishop, um, not McKissick, Bishop um, Ernest Jones out of Fayetteville, North Carolina, who saw the gift and said, hey, I want you to come over here and I want you to do this. Yeah. And that was the start of me and my ministry journey. And it's amazing because if we, want, if we rewind all the way back to middle school, I got expelled because of my mouth. <laughs> I would always talk back to teachers I will always say something I should not say. Um, they try to put me on, what do you call it, a drilling. Riddling. 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 I don't know how to say mm -hmm. it. Um, because they said I had ADHD. My mom, and, my mom and dad said, no, he doesn't. He just needs to learn how to shut up. <sighs> That's it. And so we're going to teach him how to do that. But my mouth always got me in trouble. Yeah. And my mom said, boy, one day you're going to be a preacher. And you are going to help so many people. But they, I don't really think they knew how to really guide nurture, me nurture that in gift. that way. Right. And I mean, we were talking about this off camera. We really we were. And I, and I expressed to you that, that that too was a feeling that I had, <sighs> that I had this gift and calling very early, but not really having parents who could nurture mm. that gift because I think that they were just nurturing other parts of themselves and yes. they didn't have the capacity. Zero. You know? And, and I think our parents at that time were doing what they were taught. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. so I, I don't blame my yeah. parents for for anything. It was and I'm going to say this. My mom's going to get upset when I say this. But I think all they knew how to do was pray. 
That's it. Yeah. You know. And they taught us that very well. Exactly. Right? So that part of our lives is very strong. I I, I yeah. can pray. Yeah. But I need to do some some other things and pray. But it took t <laughs> yeah, it took time to learn the other tools. Absolutely. Right? And that's where therapy for me was was a game changer. Therapy for me was a game changer yeah. after my divorce. But we I'm mean, not divorced after my separation from my ex fiance but we can talk about that okay later. i was like wait a minute you was married no 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 I it's a been separation married. Listen, from the ex fiance I don't, yeah i don't, I don't believe in divorces have hold a up title. Wait, wait a minute wait a minute hold <laughs> on i'm gonna fight for my marriage you know <laughs> you gonna fight for the marriage what? of fiance <laughs> we were separated no, 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 he no. playing a vibe no, no child but, separate no listen. no listen but it, it was good though i mean but that's one thing that my parents taught me they taught me a lot about church i mean yeah, i yeah. i knew how to, i knew how to fake passing out <laughs> Anthony, I you, knew how to fake shout. You was faking passing out. What was the nurses what, what, was coming, or you was just over in the corner by yourself? Nah, what was and, happening? And, I mean, if we just be real, I man, I think we've all done it before. You know, you. I mean, if you grow up in that church, you fake pass out, and they think the spirit signs you out. Nah, you just on the floor and you sleep. <laughs> oh my goodness! I'm just being real because it's like at at twelve or thirteen. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit never hit me, but I I knew how to do church. But I think what I would what I really needed was. How do I have a relationship with God? Yes. And yeah. then how do I how do I operate in life? Yeah. yeah. You know, because I couldn't pass out at school. They'll yeah. think I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, if I got if I if I was about to get into a fight with a young kid, I didn't even know how to defend myself. I just knew how to pray mm. while I'm getting hit upside my head. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. th there were practical things in life that that I didn't know how yeah. to do. Yeah. And all I knew was the Bible. Yeah. All I knew was I remember this. <laughs> I knew the Bible so well. A guy, I was uh, 12, right? he hit me. I turned the other cheek. Literally, you was like. Literally. <laughs> because I was scared if I, if I did anything bad because it wasn't aligned with the Bible, I would get in trouble. Mm -hmm. When I remember when I got home, my other father in California, he gave me permission to fight back. Yeah. The next day, the kid hit me, tried to fight me again. His parents came to the house because I fought back. So everything was biblical for me. Mm. No one really spent the time to teach me how to really do life. And that's why I started Young People Succeeding. That's why I, I really got into the youth ministry because I wanted to teach young people how to really succeed. BET and MTV at 18 through 21 taught me life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, who, me. who didn't learn the power of God's mercy watching BET Uncut? And tip drill. Come on. I mean, did Come you on. not learn God's goodness and mercy when Nelly swiped a Come, credit card? He showed what? you the bounty of the, God. Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you watching BET, uh, uh, what's it, MTV Cribs Makeover or MTV Cars yeah. Makeover? Like, okay, wait, when they came out with the brand new cars and they stopped the car and them wheels were spinning? Yeah. I went and bought me some wheels on credit. <laughs> because I'm like, okay, that's what that's what Rich is. You know, you when you stop and the wheels still spinning. Yeah. And so, um, but I quickly realized after my life changing experience that that's not wealth. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't desire fame. I truly do desire wealth. And if we can start teaching young people that now at 15, at 14, by the time they turn 20, 21, man, they're going to be far ahead of the game. Far ahead of the game is interesting because there were times when you felt too black for the mm. white people too white for the black people. And so how are you able to, I'm sure in many settings, it worked to your advantage. Yeah. Right? Yeah, a lot of settings. But, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. But how did that kind of shift you or what was the mindset shift in just walking your own authenticity and your own power? You know, it was, it was, it was an interesting experience. You know, I grew up in a predominantly black um, Christian environment, right? And then I shift all of a sudden to a predominantly 95, 96% white world. Yeah. When I had the great honor and a great privilege to work with um, at Ramsey Solutions, um, Dave Ramsey as a personality on his team. And that was a culture shock for me. I can imagine. You know, to go from, from black church to white world. And it's like, wait, they were doing some things there. I was like, wasn't bad. I'm like, okay, wait, really? This is what we're doing? And so I would have to adapt a little bit now mind you they never asked me to adapt but when you go into a culture like that i mean come on it's a natural like you feel as if you have to adapt. like it is some we wear the mask right it is some right. duality that we all are are walking in facts yeah. 
Right. And so I'm like, okay, wait. So I remember there were certain settings, man, that um, I felt like I couldn't be the authentic Anthony O'Neill. Mm. Then when I get back into the black settings, because I'm attached to this particular person or this particular organization or my world, I'm living in Nashville, is predominantly white. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, you're, you're a sellout. You're this, you're that. I've been called everything from uh, an Oreo on this side uh, to even... Um, respectfully saying this, you know, a, a nigger. Now watch this. When that happened, Dave, it wasn't from Dave Ramsey and them, but he jumped on back and was like, nah, that, that was inappropriately. They all attacked that particular individual at that time. So um, wait, you, you get called that? Oh, absolutely. During some sort of I remember encounter this is, in, in person? I was, in Nash I was in Nashville, Tennessee at one of the times coming back from, I had just jumped out of a plane. And at that time, me and my... You were uh, skydiving. Skydiving, mm -hmm. yes. And when we came back, we literally... Um, I was running low on gas. So I pulled over to a gas station. And at that time, we get out of the gas station. I didn't see it. I would not have pulled in. But my fiancé saw it at the time. Uh, but it was, you know, some Confederate flags there. And I didn't see it. When I get out of the car, they literally was like, what are you doing here? Mm. And I looked... And I looked ahead, like, is there another gas station? And I literally just jumped back in the car. Yeah. And I was like, hey, we have an option. We could fill it up, don't know what they're going to do, or we can try and make it to the next gas station. That's when the power of prayer came back in. <laughs> That's when, my, when everything my mom and daddy taught me, we were praying in that car trying to get to the next gas station because we only had maybe about 12 miles. And it had to be God because we drove about, I want to say about 18 or 20 miles to the next gas station. Wow. And so I have that. And then when I come back around black people, because my friend and, and dear friend, uh, Dave, is he is a very um, bold Republican. Um, automatically, I'm, I'm associated with everything that he believes in Yeah. on the black side. And I'm like, well, dang, man, can... Can I just be Anthony O'Neill? Can I yeah. can I not have Republican friends and Democrat friends? Yeah. Can I not have Christian friends and Muslim friends and Catholic friends? Like, like, can I not be this? And that brought depression to me. Mm. I would remember being on stage in front of 20,000, 30,000 people, and, and internally I'm battling who I am mm. because I love Dave. I love this organization, and I want to please them. I love my people. I want to help them and give them all the information that I have. But no one's really accepting Anthony Bernard O'Neill. Mm. That's when therapy came into play. Because right around that time, I ended my engagement uh, with, with this amazing young lady. And so I'm going through that. I go through the, the, the separation um, of her. I'm being attacked by people uh, saying, you're a sellout, you're not this. And mind you, this organization never said I was too black but I felt like I couldn't say certain things. Yeah. And so I'm feeling that internally. I am depressed internally going into the office, going on stages, going around the family because I don't feel like I could be me. So what year is this? Like what age is this? Like Man, when I'm is 32, this? I'm 39 now. So I'm 32, 31 to about 30, 35, 36. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and I'm, I'm fighting internally yeah. um, because I lost the woman that I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with. So you lost her. What was that? Do you feel you're doing? Did you play? What part did you play in that? Um, absolutely. I'm definitely. I'm not going to sit here and say that she played the majority part of it. I think we both uh, knew that it wasn't going to work. So she was um, a lot older than me. Uh, What's a lot older than you? Uh, Fourteen years. So she was 14 years older than you, mm -hmm. and you knew from an age difference perspective this wasn't going to work, or? I wouldn't say that. I just think that she was at an age to where she didn't desire at that time any more kids because she already had two. They just graduated from high school. She didn't want to be 65, 70 years old, <laughs> you know, with another yeah. kid graduating. Um, and we just, our, my therapist said something at that time, which was so good. He said, Anthony, you're coming to a mountain that she's coming off of. Mm. So it was like you. She yeah. doesn't want to go back yeah. and climb the same yeah. mountain that she just climbed and she just got off of. That's good. So, the, so I felt like what he was pretty much saying is neither one of you are wrong. You're yeah. just in two different seasons. Seasons of life. Of life. 
you know? Yeah. And I just did the math. She's only 12 years older than me. She's 12, 12 years older than me. So I was like, because I know she'll probably watch this. I'm like, hey, yo, really? Because <laughs> me and her are still good friends. Um, and and so that was that was hard for me to leave that situation because our last conversation during our um, uh, marriage counseling, it was hard. It was really hard because it was in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and I just said, hey, yeah, this is not going to work. And she gave me about the ring, and I did not see her, honestly, again until last year. Oh, wow. And I brought closure to it for her. Mm. We, had a, we had a good conversation, a good understanding. So you said in your previous relationship, it, it revealed some things about yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That you had a lot of selfishness. Yeah. Did that relationship teach you that or there was another one that came after that really showed that to you? Because no. you said something really, and this is where my notes come into play. Okay. You Let's said see. something really, really notes. good. You said that success will make you overlook your flaws. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, in my, <clears throat> in my engagement, it taught me I will be a great husband. Okay. Because I was willing to sacrifice some things for her. Mm. I was with her for five years. And I was willing to sacrifice some things that I don't think a lot of men would have sacrificed. Like what? Um, I was at that time, I was willing to like, okay, wait, you know, I, I mean, I've been with you for five years. I don't want to waste your time. So if you don't want no more kids, I'll adopt. And, my, and at that time, I was 30. My therapist said, that is that a is wrong, a, ooh, ooh, don't do that. Don't do it. Because yeah. what you'll do is you'll grow up. Yeah. And when her grandchildren are saying grandma and calling you Mr. Anthony, <laughs> you're going to grow hate towards her because she's the reason why you don't have any kids. Oh, God. That, I don't know why that would tickle me so. <laughs> they call, call you Mr. Anthony. Mr. Anthony. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> when he said that, it brought me back because I'm blessed to have legally two step parents, but I don't call them step parents. Yeah. I call them mom and dad. Yeah. And I was like, man. That would be hard, you know? And so I was like, okay. But the fact that I was willing to do that for her, I was like, all right, mm. cool. My last relationship that, that I recently ended, um, um, not recently, it was about two years, no, three years ago now. Yeah, it taught me a lot about myself that I would definitely say in that relationship, I was the cause of yeah. that relationship not ending. And it was because I'm ve I was very selfish of my time, if, I, if I'm just being honest and vulnerable here. Yeah, you've talked about this before in a previous interview. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, you talked about that, you know, you come off, you know, when you get done, you're yes. like, I want to shut down, yeah. I don't want to talk, and yeah. I didn't want to have to talk about somebody's day. I don't. Yeah. I really don't, because it's like I talk for a living. Yeah. And when I'm done shooting three shows like this right here, yeah. and I'm giving... You know, in a relationship, I'm pretty sure you know this. When you go home, hey, babe, how was your day? I can't. I have nothing left. <laughs> Write it. Sign it to me. Put a mind. Be a Yo, mind. Listen. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? And then, you know, it's not just a conversation. They, you know, ladies want to cuddle. They want to go out and get something to eat. They, they just want to talk even more. Yeah. You know, ladies talk in paragraphs. Men, we talk in <laughs> sentences. And I'm like, hey. I'm like, it was good. What, what, what was good about it? I don't know. The day was good. I mean, and, and we literally learned that. Um, and and in that particular relationship, huh, <laughs> we uh, were abstaining. Okay, so you guys were not having sex with one another. Not at all. So, so much was hanging on the communication. Absolutely. In that, the verbal communication, because you do not have that level of intimacy to connect with. Absolutely. And... Oof. It was a it was it was one of the hardest things I've ever done because she was a beautiful woman. Yeah. And so the selfish part of that wasn't just in the communication. I remember we got into an argument when we went home to visit my mom because we were watching TV and she wanted to 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 cuddle and lay up. Mm -hmm. I said, "No, ma'am, you're going to sit right over there." 
and I'm gonna sit right over here. Anthony, so you telling me how long were y'all dating? Five years, you said? Not that one. Okay. That was my ex-fiance. This is my most recent recent relationship how long that I was ended. This? Were you we were dating how? for about a year and a half. A year and a half, and mm -hmm. y'all couldn't even cuddle with each other. Y'all are abstaining in a real way. Oh no, it wasn't because of her. So she didn't want to have sex neither. Um, and and I told her, I say, hey, listen, I want to try this guy's way, right? I want, I really do want to try having a relationship with with abstaining. And the fifth, I just want to make this clear: the fifth S is it's very sexual, very sexual, okay. right? Okay, right. okay. But at the same time, I, I want to try this guy's <laughs> way. You know what I'm saying? I'm just being real here. And so the selfish part of me was like, yo, since I can't have this, if I'm going to do this, there is no touching. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's no touching. There, there's Because you just can't. And for most men listening, if y'all watching this on YouTube, wherever, put in the comments if y'all agree. You can't spoon me and expect me to not. You can't spoon me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You know what I'm saying? I'm being real. Like, me too. You can't do that with me <laughs> and expect me not to want that. So my selfishness was we can't touch. We can't do. I mean. I'm talking about and when she would come to uh, to the home, she, I'll get her a hotel room sometimes. She, or I... The, uh, the team is... They, well, <laughs> the team is I'm just being honest. You know, I'm like, I'm this, like, so... so. Wow. And my mom told me, she's like, Anthony, you got to do something, though. Because So y'all were not kissing, not... No, no. So you didn't even know if, what, what the kiss is like. No, no. Now, will I ever do that again? I'm going to be honest on your show. No, ma'am. Please I won't. don't. But I am going to say, please don't do that. I, I was like, but again, it goes back to just upbringing and training. I didn't know the middle ground. Yeah. And so now I was yeah. like, nah. It's all or nothing. It, it's, I would say it's, I can't say it's all or nothing, but it's going to be something. <laughs> <Put> some, <laughs> some... <laughs> it's going to be something. I'm going to tell you that right now. You know, I mean, and so for me, it's like, I've learned, I've learned there has to be a way and on top of that, communication wasn't good because we were long distance. So there's a lot of things that were compounding in exactly. this relationship. Exactly. Yeah. And the thing that I learned was we probably we probably could be married today if I stepped up to the plate, communicated better, gave her more of my time. Yeah. And just sucked up and said, you know what? This is what she desires. And it's not like you I was saying just day. sucked up. That yeah. This is what she does. I think in every relationship that I've learned, man or woman, we're going to suck up some things. Yeah, we just sure. have to. Yeah. It's called sacrifice. And and honestly, I would love to sacrifice some things for my best thing. You know mm. what I'm saying? So I look forward to that moment to having that. But in therapy, I learned that I am selfish. Yeah. And y'all going to laugh at this. Hopefully it doesn't come off wrong. But that's why I went and I stopped dating and I went and got me a dog. You needed to learn how to nurture. So. I, I needed to learn how to give up my time. Yeah. I needed to learn how to embrace being around someone all the time. And it really wasn't just about nurturing. It was about, okay, I need to get up and go walk you. Yeah. You know, I, you know what? I have to tend to you. I have to tend to you, yeah. right? And, it's, and and I'm not comparing a dog to to a woman <laughs> by any means. <laughs> But my therapist was like, you need to start training your mind. Yeah. And if you're just keep doing the same thing over and over and over, you're not going to attract, even watch this, not just a woman, but friends. Yeah. Because none of my friends really wanted to chill with me because I didn't want to chill with them because I was tired. And so I'm like, okay. All right. So I started forcing myself to really be out more, mm. uh, to go out with, like now if I'm in town, uh, me and my best friend, who is my pastor now, Pastor Stephen Chandler, uh, we'll go play golf every Friday. Okay. I'm forcing myself to get out because I am an introvert. Everyone thinks I'm an extrovert. But when I'm on stage, I turn on. I yeah. love being on stage. But the moment I get off of the stage, yeah. I don't want to be bothered. Yeah, because it's an outpouring. It is. And then you really got to be so, you have to be so intentional about filling up, refilling it is. You know, refueling. Yeah. It is. It is. But um, I would definitely say this to any woman who's going to date a man who's an introvert and like that, have grace. You do. You have to. Because yeah. there's a lot of positive that comes with dating, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know. But at the same time, my flaws, and I'm still working on it to this day. Um, it's, like, I tell you my prayer, man. I pray I get a this woman is, who just. You heard the Sierra prayer. This is the <laughs> Anthony prayer. Amen. <laughs> 
I pray I meet an extrovert, introvert woman. Yeah. To where I said this to one young lady I was dating, and she was so offended. She said, well, how come you don't like, like, because she said, I said, hey, I'm going to be working. And she said, well, I'll just come up to the house and just chill with you. I said, no, because if you come over here and chill with me, I feel like I got to. Like, entertain you. I got to entertain have Yo, to have to I said you. that. I have to entertain you. And she said, oh, so you have to entertain me now? Yes. I was like, <laughs> yeah, you're at my house. Yes. What am I? Yes. She was like, so, I, so, so, like, I'm a liability now? I'm like, I didn't say you was a liability. You got people under the stairs, but, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but I do need to, I have to acknowledge you. I got to do host something. You. Yes. I have to host you in my house. And that's yeah. what I said. So I was like, so. So she'd be like, well, I can't come over because you're always working and you feel like you got to entertain me. Like, I just want to be in the same room as you. Mm. And I was like, but mentally, I feel like I can't really focus and do what I really want to do because you're here. Yeah. And she stopped dating me because of that statement. Because it really does take a deep level of understanding for that type of personality trait. It It does. It really does. And so now I pray. That I can be with a woman that understands, I I I have a vision for my life. I know where I'm going in life. Yeah. Uh, and I love what I do. And so my woman has to understand that. Hey, they may be sometimes to where you may come up to the house, and I will say hello. I will make sure you have everything you need. But then I may disappear for two hours and finish my work. But I will be intentional about making sure that I come back. And that I do give you the time that we need because I don't expect a woman to marry me if I'm not giving her the time and the attention that she deserves. Yeah. But at the same time, I need a woman that understands when I'm in my zone, let me just live in that zone for a little bit because you will be the beneficiary of that zone. Yeah. And it takes a special woman to understand that. And I've had to understand that not every woman can handle that kind of woman. Yeah. Not every woman can handle that kind of man. That kind of man. It's, it's a lot to be with, you know, well, the the oh the rest is so Kevin Samuels he said a high value man <laughs> he said a high rest value soul. God rest, rest his soul. Soul. <laughs> I know the lady was saying uh, rest his soul listen, <laughs> listen I had no qualms with him though you know you didn't no I really didn't I felt like he was operating in his in his space mm-hmm. in his niche in his in his tribe, yeah, as yeah. a leader in his tribe. Yeah. And I felt like there was a lot of valid stuff that he said. You, you just know? didn't like the way he was saying certain things? It didn't bother me. I'm a straight shooter anyway. So Ooh. I feel like I like honesty and I like it served straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah You know? I like Most people, I like, like they want honesty on the rocks. They want honesty with a chaser. They want honesty with mixers. With they want, sugar. They want all the things. And I would just rather us be upfront right. and straight and direct with it. But I think, you know, all the things she said, being fit, being fine, being, you know, flirtatious, being, you know, all of those things that are required, you know, vivacious and being like childlike. Men do like that. Say it again. They say really it, do like say that. Say one more they, time. They do like a childlike go, spirit. Go through that whole list again one more time. But right. you know what I'm saying? I say Jesus. that, Anthony, because... Monica. I had to learn that. You had to learn that? Absolutely. Absolutely. That did not come easy. But, I, you know, I say that because... Why is that hard for y'all? It's hard because many of us have not grown up with examples of that, right? Mm. We grew up with examples of mothers who had to work hard because fathers were not there. We grew up watching examples of mothers who made everything happen, who were the last on the list, who always sacrificed their needs for the greater good of the children. And so we didn't see women who got to be fun and flirty and and vibrant and childlike and vivacious because they were bogged down with heavy responsibilities. That is my mom. And they were the only ones. And so we looked at women who's, you know, you always knew as a little black girl, you know, in and I can only speak from my experience, mm-hmm. from my experience, and this is not everyone's, right. this is not every black woman's experience, right. but I grew up and I saw a mother's sacrifice. Yes. And because of that sacrifice, I learned very early that no one is coming to save you. So you better know how to put on your cape and make it happen for yourself. And so I think that wow. so many of us... Wow have learned that behavior and carried into workplaces and environments. We were told, go get an education, go get a good job. Mm -hmm. Don't get tied down with no man. Don't Mm -hmm. get tied down with no baby. All of the things. And so we learned the behavior that comes along with that. Mm. And so we only were pushed that model. And so there was a lot of unlearning that I had to do. And that did not come until my mid-30s. Wow. Yeah. 
You know, a lot of ladies don't like the saying when they say most men don't want to date that successful woman. And because it's because they don't of wanna, those traits. Yeah, and they don't want to date their mother. You're absolutely yeah. right. My mom worked three jobs yeah. my entire life growing up because she wanted to make sure her kids had a good Christmas. Yeah. And I that don't want to marry that woman. And that Because that doesn't look like a fantasy. No. I, it, honestly, when, when I look at my mom... She's never told me this. I don't know if my mom was 100% happy in her marriage. Yeah. Because no. she was working three jobs. Yeah. She's still married to him. I know she loves him, but I'm yeah. like, what's, like, I don't want that. So everything, when I look at my mom, I want the complete opposite. I think we all have, have been, we've had to face that in the mirror within ourselves. We've all had to do that. Mm. And I think that that even plays into why, you know, so many of us are marrying much later. Because we looked Lord at Jesus. the sacrifice and we mm -hmm. said, oh, freedom looks so much better. It sure does. Freedom looks better. Yes. Because that looks like that's too much. Yes. Yeah. And so many of us made that decision. And so when you look at, as a black woman who's over 40 and, you know, has, has been on other shows, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and caught quite a, you know, response as talking about being, a, you know, a woman over 41 and dating. But I understand and recognize that I had to do a lot of unlearning in order to be this version of me. Mm. I had to do a lot of unlearning. Mm. You know? Yeah. It's a touchy subject. I'll bring you at the table. We can have this conversation <laughs> on the table. Because, I mean, why, I think we need to have that. Why is it touchy, that. though? Why is it touchy? Here's why it's touchy. It's because I don't know how to even say it. It's, then just say it. Well, it's like I think someone told me that something's wrong with me because I'm I'm turning 40 and I'm successful with no kids. Of course, yes. And that that's what it's a red flag. Major. I, I'm a woman who's unmarried with no children. Red flag. Nobody. She ain't even got no baby. Res I respected flag. my womb. Hello? But you, you <laughs> move like you're married. You know people say that to me all no, the listen, time. No, listen. I asked one of your team members earlier today like about your husband. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I thought you was married. Like you My moved. twin sister is married. I have a twin sister who is married. Figured that. Yeah. Right. I know yeah. you had twins. I was like, okay, wait. But you move and operate like you're married. People say that to me all the time. Which is a good thing. Yeah. I already know I am a wife. You know, Absolutely. I am a wife. You know, my husband. And, and this, you know, it's interesting because have people, like, yes, I, people have wanted to marry me. Yes. And I'm not using that as a badge of honor. And you I'm using yes? that to show that, yeah, I'm a good woman. I, I I haven't said yes, no. Mm. And we'll that was this down to my show. We didn't, you know, I did not feel, and I say this, that I, I wanted to land my plane there. You know, my mama said something to me young. She said two things to me recently after my last breakup. She said, You know what, son? You know the common denominator in all of your relationships, why they didn't work? And I was like, What, mom? She's like, it's you. Me. And I was like, I yes. I receive that. Totally. I, I really and do. totally accept that. Really do. Yeah. And she's like, because you know my list. My mom doesn't really like my list. <laughs> because my list is simple. I have five S's. Safe, sweet, smart, skilled, very sexual. She frowns on the very sexual part. But I'm like, mom, I led with saved. I led with the woman who's sweet. And uh, someone who is smart. Someone who is skilled. Those four things are actually... Very, very important to me because where I'm going in life, what I'm building in life, I need a woman who has some level of a skill that can partner with me to Absolutely. help build this thing. Yeah. I said, now, the very sexual part, mom, that is also very important to me because I don't want to cheat, I don't want a divorce, Listen. and I don't want bad sex in my marriage. And I'm like, so I got to marry a woman that she has all five of those, but that generation says that sex is not important. Yeah, And so for me, the reason why it took me so long to get here and get to a place where I'm like, I'm really, really ready is because that's all I hear in my head was she got to love the Lord. She got to be able to get on her knees and pray for you and da, 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 da. And one of my homeboys said, and when she get done praying to God on her knees. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you don't know what that do. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it was a pastor. I ain't going to say his name. You know what I'm saying? And he was like, no, nah, that's real. It is he said because real. He's like, if God made sex, why do Christians frown away from talking about sex and money? And we look at it, those are the reasons, reasons why, why divorces are ending. Two. Sex yeah. and money. Yeah. The two things we frown upon yeah. 
in the church world. Yeah. And the only thing we talk about in the church about money is tithing. Tithe, the only yeah. thing we talk about church when it comes to sex is do it after marriage. Don't he fornicate. Was, don't fornicate. Yeah. And and it's like, I'm like, wow. And so that's all that I heard was it's not all about the money. It's not all about the sex. And I'm like, well, I agree with that. It is just as important yeah. as a woman being saved to me. I think it's very important. I think, you know, so many of, and especially when you talk about black women and you dating mm -hmm. black women, right? Mm -hmm. Actively, you're That's actively so seeking while you're maximizing your single Shram. season. You're actively seeking, I'm right? willing to seek. You're willing to seek. Yes. You said that, and I was like, well, what does that mean? Like, as I am serving and as I am building, if I see some someone, I'm about to say something, someone, <laughs> a woman who is interested, I will, I will seek. Okay. I think for my younger days, I was just seeking. I was just going out looking, 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 and it distracted me from building. Yeah. So I want to make sure that when I meet my wife, that I've built something of substance, that when she comes into it, like she's she's walking into something good and she's not saying, Dang, you 40, you ain't you ain't do all this yet. <laughs> like I, I want her to be like, Okay, you've been maximizing this season. Yeah. And you were waiting for me. All right, let's go higher. Let's have some fun. I'm telling you, man. Listen. Uh oh. When I he didn't cross get married, <laughs> I'm tell y'all this right now. We going on vacation. Our honeymoon gonna be at least sixty days. You talked about this. You said sixty days. You need sixty days because you are days. you're ready to have a whole lot of sex. Oh, we what? That you having a whole lot of sex. Listen, and before are, we even hit the reception, we having sex. And y'all casting vision. Y'all having sex and casting cast vision. vision. That's what are what we you doing? Say. When yeah. we get back home, this is where we going. This is what we're doing. I'm talking about while we're having sex, we're talking Cast about the vision. vision. He said, you got to preach to me while you're on me. Okay? You got you to gotta speak some Listen, things on me. Speak to me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, why, it's the best time to have a conversation. I mean, you're going to get all, everything you need. Everything. <laughs> everything you need, you know? And it's like, why not? And here's yeah. the thing. We, we're not struggling over money. Finances is not yeah. an issue. We're getting back home, and we are going to be just so focused, but I want to have a healthy, fun, productive marriage. Yeah. I don't want it just to be a, oh, men are doing good. No, no, no. I want to get excited when I come home. And yeah. I know couples today who are not excited going home. Yeah. yeah. And I understand that we'll have some down seasons, but I think if I get those five S's, the down season, we'll be able to get through them together. Yeah. Yeah. And I won't date a woman who doesn't go to therapy. You won't date a woman who doesn't go to therapy. If she has not gone to therapy, I will not date her. She has had to. One of the prerequisites in dating you is that you have had to have gone through, started the process of some sort of therapy. Absolutely. Because I need you. I need you. I need you healing. I don't need you healed, but I need you taking the first step for yourself of healing. I mean, I think you said you, you said it. Repeat. I need you. Mm -hmm. And I think in order for me, like, to really get the maximizing of this relationship, yes. you yeah. know, maximum potential. Maximum. I need you. Maximum. And that's what people don't understand. I need you. Right. And so we got all these lists. You have a list. Right. And we live in this dating world of lists, right? You got a list? Um, My list, I do have a list. Okay. Yeah. One of the things, a couple things on my list. I'll give you five things. Five, like mine. Five. I'm going to do five because you did five. Okay, let's go. Honesty, Honestly. integrity, okay. a man of good character. Okay. He's respected for his wisdom. Okay. He is respected by his family and his children if he has them. He's respected mm. for his word. Yeah. He's and not he, respectful, but he's respected. He's respected. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I want you to be respected. And if That's you have children, good. I want them to respect you because that that honor is gonna show up in how they show up in the world. Ooh. You know. I respect my father, and this is a reason why I show up in the world the way that I do. And right, so right. I learned that. And then the other thing is that he is slow to anger, quick to love. That's good. Those are my top five. That should be easy to find. I felt like, you know, it's here. And, and I will say this. I've, I've had some amazing love in my life. Okay. Amazing okay. love, amazing people. Some of those relationships are still so good. We're still good friends. And not in a sense of like, we sit on the phone and talk every day. That's not it. Okay. But we love each other enough to check on each other in seasons. Mm. You know, like, I ain't heard from, what's going on? How you doing? You know, and mm. I feel like that's just a mark of, you know, the season of love that we shared. And maybe yeah. we weren't meant to go into this next season, but I, I've had some really, really good, good men in my life. That's good. Yeah, that have really loved me. Yeah. Every single woman that's been in my life were great ladies. 
Yeah. I just met them at the wrong season. And I think that that, that was a lot of it, too, in mm -hmm. my own life. Mm -hmm. And there is no regret for me, even at 41 years old, mm -hmm. um, as not being married and not having children. I think that there has been a divine reason for my singleness. Wow. And so I think that for the life that I am able to live right, right yeah. now has required mm. this season of me to become this version of me, right? Mm. The better me. And therapy, I am so grateful that I was not married to somebody before I went through therapy. For real. I am so grateful because mm. I would have damaged something that didn't need to be damaged. Right, right, right. I would have turned a world upside down that didn't have to be torn up because I didn't know how to how to wield my power. Facts, facts. And it's taken me time to learn how to, you know, my scepter, you know, and my 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 gavel and all of the things that I get to carry. Yep. It's taken me time to really learn how to use them properly. You know, I think I tell all the men who I have the opportunity to kind of mentor and lead and guide in, in this season of my life, therapy is needed tremendously. Yeah. And I wouldn't be the man who I am today without therapy. Absolutely. Because I, I think we are programmed to blame everyone else. And therapy has taught me before you point the finger at anyone, what is it that, what yeah. did you do? Yeah. And how, even if someone says something and you say, well, that offended me. Well, wait, why did it offend you? Yeah. So it may be something internal that you need to process to kind of fix that, 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 that feeling that you have. And I'm like, wow. And so now, man, I do something and, and, and uh, this is your show. I don't, I don't know how much time we got left, but I do something now that has really transformed my entire life. Um, that has helped me make millions, that has helped me build a great business, is I go to silent retreats. Have you done one? First of all, you are in my head, so just go ahead. We have what? a track, and we in the spirit room right now. Oh, okay, so okay, okay. So I'm with you, yeah. I, 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 I do this thing called a silent retreat because I started noticing that I'm so consumed by the internet, I'm co so consumed by what's on YouTube, yeah. what's on podcasts, yeah. what's yeah. on the yeah. social media world, and uh, my... My pastor, not my pastor, but my uh, spiritual father in the ministry, Rudolph McKissick Jr., um, his father did a silent retreat while I was there. And I couldn't make it uh, because of uh, I was working. But I said, you know, I'm going to try that one day. And um, I tried it. Yeah. And I did it for three days. Me too. I did that. And I, it was the hardest thing <sighs> I've ever done. Yeah. Because it's complete silence. You're not talking when you're going to get something to eat. Your phone is off. You couldn't even listen to worship music yeah. at this particular yeah. spot. Um, and so I went to a spot to where we went to the beach. So the only thing you hear is water. And I went to the mountains. The mountains. Yeah. I would fall asleep in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good because while I was there, we saw a uh, therapist in the morning and we mm. saw a therapist in the evening. Okay. And that was the only time we could talk. And in the morning time, they gave us an assignment that had to go to the night therapist so the morning time was a spiritual therapist starting out the day evening time we ended it with a therapist i was able to call my therapist on zoom oh wow yes we had yeah to go we were it. in meditation so the I did, whole time yeah no talking yoga and meditation yoga and meditation yeah the entire time yeah. my god i couldn't uh, the yoga <laughs> i couldn't do and meditation eight hours a eight day. hours a day yeah and you well you couldn't talk for eight and you could talk to other no talking. No talking. I had a word sign that says, said my name. I'm in silence. Wow. And I had to give you a notepad to write down anything that you need. Well, yeah, on this beach resort, once you walk in a building, there is no talking. And, and it says you can talk here. That's in a therapy Oh, room. wow. Yeah. But outside of that, even when we went to pick up our food, we had point. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was good because I wrote down so much about me. Yeah. Um... The therapist even asked me, what do you not like about yourself? That was a question that took me every bit of eight hours. What did you say? I didn't like the fact that I was selfish. I didn't like the fact that I was so single. I didn't like the fact that sometimes I am lonely. I didn't like the fact that I work hard. Um, I didn't like the fact that um, I didn't like how I treated my, my other mother, stepmother, when I was younger. Um, um, 
I, I didn't like how I transitioned from certain relationships. After that, I came back and apologized to um, friends, family members about some of the last conversations that we've had. But the biggest apology I ever made was I apologized to myself. Mm. What did you say to yourself? I, it was simple. I'm sorry. Mm. I'm sorry for not being true and real with you. Like, I'm sorry for, for, for bearing the truth and living in a lie in certain areas of our life. I'm sorry that we went out in front of public. And now when people ask me, how are you doing? If I'm not doing well, I tell them the truth. Yeah. And I don't ask people, how are you doing anymore? Because I know nine times out of 10, they're going to give me a lie. Yeah. And sometimes, let's be real, I don't want to have that conversation with you if you are <laughs> feeling bad. Because yeah. I'm not in a space to do that. But it's just program, right? So when people would ask me, how am I doing? I would lie. And I would come home and live that lie. I would come home and I would live in the success of selling, you know, thousands of books and living a success of speaking on stage, being on national TV and doing this stuff. But I never really stopped and said, Hey, how are you? And let's take care of you. I've always taken care of others. I've always lived up to everyone else's thoughts and opinions of me. And I never took time to heal me to really, really go deep into how I'm doing. And I think that's one reason why I was still single and am still single. It's because God knew deep down at the surface, you're a good man. You're a successful man. You're an attractive young man. But at the core, oh, no, son, I can't bring one of my daughters to you. And you have not honestly taken the time to address you at your core. Yeah. And I had to apologize to myself for not doing that. Yeah. And now that's all, that's all we do. Now when I wake up, one of my good friends, Dr. Nita Phillips, said something on my show. She said, when you wake up, Anthony, I want you to, before you do anything, just sit there for 10 minutes and ask yourself, how are you doing? Yeah. And live in that feeling and be honest with your feeling. And if you're not doing good, ask yourself, why am I not feeling good? Yeah. And now when I wake up every single morning, that's the first thing that I ask myself. How am I doing? Why am I feeling this way? So now I know how to move throughout the day. Yeah. And it allows me with my team, uh, my staff, and, and, and anyone that's around me for that day now I can check myself rather than them getting that information and they're like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Like I know how to approach the day now. Yeah. And I wasn't doing that. I'll just get up, go to the gym, work out, turn on some, some Jeezy and, <laughs> and I will hide my true feelings. Mm. And I will wonder why I was snapping at my team, why I was snapping at my daggone dog. And she looked at me like, like what's wrong <laughs> with you? And I'm like, it's me. And I think successful individuals, we, we tend to live in our success hide our truth and the silent retreat really revealed to me that you're successful but you're still failing in some other areas yeah and now at 39 about to hit 40 i'm like okay my wife needs success in those areas yeah if i'm blessed to have children they need success in those areas and i have to work on it now which is why I'm very big on single people maximizing our single season. Yeah. And we do that by getting to therapy, by acknowledging our fault, um, our failures. And failures is not a bad thing. Failure yeah. just means you can learn from it. It's lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just so many lessons. Yeah. And so your biggest lesson that you learned from silence was that it's okay to have successes, but it's also okay to have failure. It is. And to not allow your failures to dictate your future. Mm. Because I think sometimes if we don't address it, it will take over. Yeah. And I don't want my future to, to be determined by the things that I hid. Mm. Wait, oof. hold on, because somebody going to miss that one. Yeah, I'm serious. Like I, I, don't I don't want my future to be determined by the things by that the I things purposely hid. I've hidden. Mm -hmm. Oof. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. that's going to hit somebody in the parking lot. It's the truth. <laughs> and as I started noticing that, man. Yeah. Things of today are because of the things that I I hid two, five, ten years ago. Yeah. And I don't wanna You don't, don't wanna don't hide want anymore. No. 
So what are you looking for? You said you're about to turn 40. Mm -hmm. You know, 40 is a shift that happens. It's a whole new decade. It's a whole new era of your life. What are you looking forward to? Man, I'm in legacy right now. Okay. You know, I'm really (laughs) in the whole legacy point. I don't have a wife yet. I don't have any kids. Um, I don't even know at 40 if I want kids. I I don't know. I think right now. Yeah. That's very fair. It's like, you know, I want a wife for yeah. sure. And then her and I would decide what that looks like. But That's where I am. Like, <laughs> I'm like, and I already, I tell people all the time, like, you know, because of my age, I said, now, if I do get do? pregnant uh-huh. and have a baby and okay. I get pregnant, I just know when you see me, I'm doing the Lord's work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the Lord's work. I'm doing the Lord's work. That that lady, she's doing the Lord's Come work. Come on now. She's doing the Lord's work. Look Boy, at her. She's look, doing the Lord's work. Look at this so hill. if you see me, look just know hill. I'm doing the Lord's work. My God. <laughs> and he is pleased with you. Yes, ma'am. So that's it. Yeah. I'm serious. I mean, but it's like now it's it's um and, and it's and it's so funny because I feel the shift in me internally. Yeah. Just this year I did a full estate plan and I was like, Am I really doing an estate plan right wow. now? And it's just me. And it's like You have you nieces, nephews? I do. And okay. so they are you very close with them? Very, very close. Okay. You know, my little brother just you had rich, a baby. Uh, rich uncle vibes. You you rich uncle vibes. That's what they call me. Rich uncle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's what they call me. And it's yeah. like and it's because I don't give them gifts. So all of them have five twenty nines. And so we just, I just sew into that. So I've never given them a Christmas gift. I've never given them a birthday gift. Wow. Um, I've just only sewn money. When my parents started the 529, I just started my own. And so for them, my goal is at 18, we cut them a large check. Well, I cut them a check. Grandma and granddaddy cut them a check. And then my nieces and nephews are actually, they're famous. You know what I'm saying? So they've done stuff for John Legend, for Apple, for, I mean, they're very, very, uh, bright kids so they have money that they don't even know that they have set aside so you know we are raising young men and and young ladies of influence of wealth and literally when they turn 18 they'll probably come into about a quarter million to three hundred thousand dollars just sitting there for them that's awesome so everything for me is right now is legacy and and just praying that god puts the right woman in front of me to find and to pursue um and after that too it's my company i have a great team and it's you know i want to make other millionaires on my team um i've i've had the opportunity to be in rooms of millionaires who've helped i want you to say this and what? i'm stopping you because you you went to a mastermind you I went did. to a mastermind I did. of people who were making 100 plus million a year oh yeah and you walk into that room you say i got to shut up Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think sometimes when we walk into rooms, we want to like show people we got it. In this room, I heard God say, shut up. (laughs) And ask questions. Was it hard for you? Yes. To shut up? It really was. Mm. It really was. Because here's the thing. I come in that room and and I'm known. So they're asking me questions. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not my assignment. I I need your help. I will help you for sure, but I want to listen. Yeah. And I promise you, I was there for a weekend. I joined this mastermind for a year. And I was a part of this mastermind. And because I listened, I met two people in that mastermind. Uh, One of his name is Colin Boyd. And I'm a preacher at heart. So I know how to communicate. I know how to encourage people. I know how to move the crowd. I didn't know how to effectively sell. Mm -hmm. Like how to sell something that I know you can benefit from. So I'm thinking because I'm a preacher, I can sell. But selling effectively and not feeling grimy is different from communicating. Yeah. And after sitting down with him for six months, my company did a little over $2 million just in that one particular part. And it really even just, it wasn't even just courses. It was a little bit of everything, selling on my show, how to properly get people to subscribe. And like he really taught me the art of understanding people's felt need and and providing to their felt need. Mm. And I was like, okay, this is good. And if I would not have been in that room, if I would not have just listened, Mm. I wouldn't have gotten what I've gotten. So many people probably need to hear that because they may be walking into rooms that they feel like they need to be doing all the talking. No. Yeah. No, I was at the barbershop the other day 
getting ready to come on this good show, and I know <laughs> all these good. The, the lineup's crispy. Oh, you thank know, you. I gotta thank let you, you know. It's barber, crispy. she, she I said you. it. Bro. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in the barber shop, and one of the guys he recognized me and said, "Hey, yo, I gotta ask you a question, man. Like a young man like myself, if I'm trying to get in the room, when I get in the room, what do I say?" And I said, "That's the wrong question. Hmm. The question is not what you say. The question is what you ask." Hmm. And one thing I like about you, Brandy, is that you studied me like crazy and you knew what to ask. And I think sometimes when we get in the room, we didn't do no studying. Yeah. We didn't do no research. Yeah. We, we, we know what we want to say and how we want to impress. Yeah. But the biggest way to impress, if you get in the room with a Bill Gates, with a Steve Harvey, with a, you know, a Bishop T.D. Jakes, it's what kind of questions are you asking that's sending them a message that lets them know you studied. Yeah. And I'll never forget when I got in, in my first room with Bishop Jakes. I've been in several with him um, now. Um, I asked him the right questions. Yeah. 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 You know, and it's like, for me, anytime I get into the room, when I was working with Dave Ramsey, I always asked him a question before I bought my first house, before I made my first big investment, before I even got married. I'm like, hey, Dave, you know, you, you, you worth a quarter, quarter billion dollars. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about this? Yeah. What do you think about that? And I listened. Yeah. Now, did I always listen? That's a different subject. But for the most part, I wanted to ask the right questions. And um, it was a very well-known pastor who said this to me, and, I, and I, I took it from him. He said, Anthony, one thing I like about you is every time you got in this room, you maximize this room. Yeah. And that's, that's what it's all about, is maximize the room you're in. You maximize his interview because you, you did some time to study. I don't think we study. Yeah. And we got to study. Study to show that self-approved. Come on now. So as we close this, I feel like I want to say that you are the king of maximizing. I am. you maximizing every season of your life, whether it's your single season, your business season, you are maximizing. So as we close out, what's one piece of advice that you would give to our audience to maximize and take their life to the next level? That's a good question. I mean, there's so many things that I would say. I wish I just could one. say, but just, just one could be stuck on time. Just She's looking one. at me. Just give me one. No, no, no. Up. Look, I, <laughs> I know that you have many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I know that you have many because you've done all of the work to get many. But what's the one that if you say, look, if you don't pick up nothing else, you better take this one and run with it to the bank. You know, Jay-Z is going viral right now yeah. because of his yeah, response yeah. to um, his, his amazing interview on CBS with Gail. And she asked him the question of, you know, would you take the yeah. meeting with you if you were younger to 500000 He said, no, that's a bad deal. He said, because I've already put all of my wisdom and life experiences inside of the, yeah. inside of the music. Yeah. And a lot of people are responding, yeah. that's crazy. Of course, Jay-Z would say that because he's a billionaire. No, 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 no. Yeah. Listen, everything that Jay-Z is teaching you is inside of a book somewhere. Yeah. It's inside of a podcast. It's inside. Of, it's, it's on YouTube. And so if you really want to maximize, get off of Netflix, get off of... Um, reality TV shows and go study yeah. and go read yeah. that will equip yeah. you to get more information, more wisdom. And then when you do get in the room, what's going to happen is now that you have this wisdom and knowledge here, now you're going to get even more and you're really taking advantage of the room now. That's it. Because Jay-Z doesn't have the time to teach you how to budget. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he's not going to sit there and say, yeah. here's how you add yeah. and subtract. Yeah. No, no, no. You need to come to the table with more than the basics, yeah. a little bit more than you need to be on an advanced level. So now we can really teach you something and that's maximizing the room. I mean, and that is the sheer purpose of these conversations. Absolutely. I come with all the preparation so we can dive deeper and you. know <laughs> the, the real deal oh, man. behind what it means to be real, to be relevant, yes. to be relatable in a season like this. Anthony O'Neill. <sighs> I have enjoyed you so. Hey, man, thank, thank you. Thank you I, so much. I Listen, I'm coming back. <laughs> He's coming back, and then I'm <laughs> jumping on a plane to go yes. with him. And so I thank you guys for joining us for another impactful, very thought-provoking conversation with one of the world's most influential entrepreneurs and people. I'm so grateful for these conversations. Make sure you like, make sure you comment, make sure you subscribe, and join this community because we got more good stuff on the way. Anthony O'Neill, thank you so much. Until next time, you guys, eat well, give a damn, move your body every single day. Peace.